Hello and welcome to Jessie Bear Book Club. Today we are reviewing The She-Wolf by Maurice Durand. I know it's been a minute since we reviewed any of the Cursed King series because we've been focusing on House of the Dragon, but here we are, we are back in business. So why not get started? During my first read through of this series, this is the book where I lost interest because you skip over the whole reign of Philip the Long and pick up six years later from where the last book left off in England, not France, with the escape of Roger Mortimer from the Tower of London. The escape is a very good, tense read, and then you move along to the court of Edward II, where Edward is informing his wife Isabella of Mortimer's escape, even though she already knows because she helped organise his escape. There is a lot of back and forth between them, and Isabella gives as good as she gets. This is the first time in this series you get to meet Edward II up close, and even though he is hateful to his wife and royal to the point of stupidity, he isn't unintelligent, just very socially unaware, in my opinion. Edward II's blatant homosexuality seems to be the root cause of most of his court's dislike for him, as well as his spoiling of his lover, Hugh Dispenser, as well as his entire family. The Dispensers are greedy, and you see that very early on. They are taking off the Queen's plate, and because they are taking off Isabella's plate, this is angering her son, Prince Edward, who is turning to his mother's side. What follows is chapter upon chapter of Roger Mortimer's exile in France. He meets up with good old Ptolemy, our favourite banker, who introduces him to Robert of Artois, who is one of his cousins, and Ptolemy grants Roger a loan so he can live in France. Roger is then introduced to Valois by Robert of Artois, and they all cook up a plot to ferment rebellion in Aquitaine, trying to get Edward II to declare war on France. Valois is basically running France at this point for Charles the Fair, who is now king, because he is useless and more concerned about his new wife than anything else. He keeps getting introduced to Roger Mortimer, and then cannot remember a single thing about him, which of course is angering Mr. Mortimer. Over a year passes, but they finally ride out for Aquitaine, because the English have finally arrived to defend their lands from French incursions. It's all very male, if you get my meaning. I can see why I lost interest in this series the first time around I tried to read it. There are lots of descriptions of horses and pretty armour and swords. There is also no Marine Guccio, no plotting poisonous mout. All the characters we have grown attached to in the first four books haven't turned up yet. Valois sets out for Aquitaine and starts besieging Edmund, Earl of Kent, the King of England's half-brother. Edmund is the King of England's representative in France, but Edmund's back is up against the wall because his backup never arrives from England and he ends up having to surrender to his uncle, Valois. It's all a bit incestuous. Edmund's mother is Valois and Philip the Fair's sister. Edmund has a long conversation with Roger Mortimer during the surrender negotiations, and Edmund decides that the dispensers are the reason his backup never arrived from England, and believes himself now safer as a French hostage than going back to England defeated. This really showcases the powers the dispensers wield under Edward II, because a prince of the blood should not be scared for his life. This is where we really get into the incestuous family bush that is the royal family of England and the royal family of France. Philip the Fair's sister, Marguerite, was the second wife of Edward I of England, and they had two sons, Kent and Norfolk, who are half French. Valois is their uncle. King Charles of France is their first cousin, making Isabella, Queen of England, their first cousin, as well as their sister-in-law. Then we get back to Fat Bouville, who we haven't seen for a while, who is yet again back at the papal court of Avignon, trying to convince the Pope to give Valois the money owed for the impending crusade that everyone now knows at this point is never going to happen. In the end, the Pope, wily old Cardinal Duese who was, 
pays off Valois to get him to give up the notion of this ridiculous crusade. This is the only means of really dealing with Valois at this point, because he's always broke. It's really nice seeing two characters from the previous books interact. It is the first time in this book we have seen it so far. Dweze starts asking about Gutio because he liked Gutio, and Marie and whatever happened to their marriage and my interest peaks. Fat Bouville ends up spilling his guts about everything that went wrong with little King John and Marie's baby John, and that the real King of France is hiding out in a manor somewhere with his foster mother, and only Fat Bouville and Marie know the truth because Bouville's wife is now dead. And now the Pope knows that wily old fox Doese. Of course, he is trying to spin this new knowledge to his advantage in any way he can. Now, Isabella, Queen of England, arrives in France to negotiate the treaty over Aquitaine, but she is really here to get away from her abusive husband and his lover. Isabella immediately takes up with Roger Mortimer. They form a blood brother pact, going to bed straight after that. It's very intense reading, and very intense behaviour for people who only had a casual acquaintance before now, but it makes sense as both these people have been under an immense amount of pressure. King Charles's interactions with his sister Isabella seem a bit off compared to what we know of him from earlier books. He seems extremely stupid. I always thought if any of the cafe boys were stupid it was Louis the Outan, but Charles seems almost simple-minded. Asking Roger Mortimer the same question over and over, and his complete preoccupation with needing a son, his still blaming Isabella for his first wife Blanche's infidelity, it's all a bit much. Isabella and Roger have a very intense love affair. It's kind of first love intense, at least for Isabella. Then we have Valois' slow decline into death, and I found it very sad reading, and extremely scary. It was well written. The idea of being paralysed by a stroke and the fear of the endless void, the fact that Valois finds no comfort in his family was extremely upsetting to me, especially the bit where his family only perk up at his deathbed when he starts making bequests in his will. Robert of Artois takes place as first councillor after Valois' death and continues to support Queen Isabella as she starts planning to raise troops to invade England with money from the Lombard bankers. It's interesting here to see how the Lombards support Isabella because Edward II owes them so much money and he's refusing to pay. This is classic Iron Bank if I've ever seen it. Maut, of course, is completely against Robert of Artois' influence on the king, so starts intriguing with the English against Isabella, telling Edward II about Isabella's ongoing affair with Roger Mortimer, which forces Edward II to write letters to King Charles demanding his wife back, and after months of consistent letter writing and Maut's persuasion, using the death of her daughter Blanche, Charles' first wife, as leverage, Charles decides that his sister, Isabella, Queen of England, must leave France and return to her husband. There is also the fact that King Charles has never forgiven his sister, Isabella, for her part in bringing to light the infidelity of his first wife, Blanche. And of course, now Isabella looks like a hypocrite because she has been unfaithful herself. Robert of Artois alerts Isabella and Mortimer to King Charles's plot to send her them back to England to face judgment, and they safely escape to Belgium. Meanwhile, in the background of these great events, Guccio is back in France and goes about collecting his son from Marie. Marie is still suffering from PTSD and fear and refuses to see Guccio, so he takes his nine-year-old son away. The son, of course, is actually the real King John of France. This leaves Marie completely bereft and still longing to see Guccio. The scene in Paris when Guccio introduces his son Giannino to Queen Clemence and Clemence doesn't know that this boy is her actual son was painful reading. Then we have the conquest of England which is long to read about until we get to the executions. The execution of Hugh Dispenser the Younger 
was gruesome in extreme detail, but I couldn't put the book down. And the delight Isabella took in watching her husband's lover mutilated really soured the high moral ground she liked standing on, especially the sexual satisfaction she seemed to get out of it. It even disturbed Mortimer. I really like Isabella's son, Edward III. He is a sensible little guy and more like his grandfather, the Iron King, than any of his other relatives. His refusal to claim the crown without his father's formal abdication, if not sentimental, was morally right. The bit in the book where the three jailers shave Edward II's head in between moves from prison was needlessly cruel and actually really upset me because we only ever hear about Edward's cruelty off page. So that got me wondering how much of it was him and how much of it was actually the dispensers manipulating him. Then there is Isabella's hesitation to have Edward II killed and thinking back over her life with him. It wasn't all bad. She loved her coronation and being queen. The birth of their children was special and above anything else, she wanted to love him. I feel as if Isabella was bullied into having Edward killed by Roger Mortimer. The scene where he threatens to leave her because he is jealous of Edward, storming off to manipulate her, makes me despise Mortimer as a small man. Then there is the fact that Mortimer obviously knows about the cruelty being inflicted on Edward II while in captivity, the lack of food, being made to sleep beside a dry well filled with rotten meat. You've got to remember that Edward II pardoned Mortimer from death after he committed treason, so he is kinder than his own captor now. Then there is a fact Edward II wants to join a monastery because he knows he was a bad king and wants to repent. The whole thing really makes me pity Edward and his utter fear when he is brought into the nice room, knowing they are going to kill him in there for sure. And the red hot poker up his ass made me feel sick and then want to have a shower. The description of it was utterly horrific and so cruel and disgusting. They were mocking him for his sexuality. It's just horrible, just ugh. But it was probably quite historically accurate. I give this book seven out of 10. Some bits I enjoyed much more than others. The time jump was a little bit jarring and I never thought I would say this, but there wasn't enough Marie and Guccio drama. I also thought there wasn't enough Isabella and Edward POVs, and a lot of the stuff is written in the third person, when I would have preferred it to be written in a POV, but I think that is my own personal preference when it comes to storytelling. Goodread gives this book 4.1 out of 5. Also, is this book called The She-Wolf or The She-Wolf of France? Because I have heard it described online by both titles. So, I'm a little confused. Leave me a comment with your thoughts on that. Until next time, send me a like if you like my Accursed King series content and subscribe so you don't miss the rest of this series. Until next time, don't become blood brothers with a convicted traitor. Bye!